when you gather, it's obvious all of Genesis was there. There's no way to prove, you know, what, out of what's missing that it's identical with what we have. But at the same time, when you look at what is there and it is identical with what we have, that's pretty pretty substantial. And so that shows that the the evidence suggests that the Bible has not been tampered with. The our earliest Bible we have up to that time is about a thousand. Can you hear me now? Now with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've got pieces of scriptures that go back to the first and second century BC, so well over a thousand years earlier. And so, what's interesting about this is you've got that. You've also got extra biblical <laughs> books. Have, in man, general, the enemy must prophecy, have been trying to get in the way history, of our study or things something. Like that. You've got the community rule and the Damascus Covenant, Can you things hear me? about their order, what they believe and why, and that's fascinating. We touched on that a little bit last week, looking at a phrase called the mystery to come and what that entailed. Okay, so you've good. got all those kind of documents, and then you have also commentaries. Commentaries are really neat because you can have uh, the same scriptures, and in many cases you may have ah, like whoa. all of Genesis without whoa. chapter 7, whoa. for instance. But maybe in the commentaries they have commentaries on chapter 7. So when you put them all together, we actually get more in the Old Testament that way than is usually thought. So we've got a good amount. But the commentaries are nice because they will tell you, we believe this means this. And that might be right and it might be wrong, but it's really nice to have. So like when you have um, go to a Baptist church, a Nazarene church, a Catholic church, you're going to have statements of faith, catechism, things like that, that say, we believe one, two, three. We believe these comments or these scriptures mean this. Yeah, and sorry, that might be right or wrong, right now, but it so tells you what much. the denomination actually believed. And so since we're told by Josephus and others that they were accurate prophets, 100% accurate prophets, it's really interesting to kind of see this whole thing put together. So tonight what I wanted to look at is kind of a fundamental uh, concept. So as a Christian, when you bring up something, like we talked last week about uh, Isaiah, uh, the prophecy about a virgin giving birth. And we went to Matthew, and in Matthew it says, well, this is a prophecy about Jesus, and it literally means Mary was still a virgin. She was uh, overpowered or overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and she had a baby boy, but she had never been with a man. So it was a fulfillment of a prophecy, okay? Um, and so we would say that's the interpretation because... As a Christian, we follow the New Testament. The New Testament tells us how to properly interpret the prophecies. Well, when you go to a Pharisee, though, they're going to say there is no virgin birth, for instance. It means something else. Well, why would we believe them? They say that there is an oral Torah. And in the oral Torah, Moses basically explains the some things written, other things by word of mouth. And we're telling you that it means but it was whatever, only in the second, second because we have the secret teachings handed down early from they Moses, actually jot, jotted and those they down. may or and may not. All, and even if they did, us. it's really are easy to garble something that's never written down. So that's just like a really bad, you know, start anyway. Well, the Essenes will come along and say, well, we know what it means because remember that the New Testament hasn't been written yet. We have the writings of the patriarchs. And the patriarchal writings are supposed to be a kind of pre-Mosaic canon, if you will. So we officially have the Mosaic canon, or the Old Testament, which is Genesis through Malachi. Then there's the 400 oh, silent wow. years, as it's called, simply because there's no addition to the canon. The canon was closed, according to the other extra-biblical writings. So we've got what we consider 39 books in the Old Testament that's sealed, closed, not supposed to add to it. And then the Messiah comes along, and we've got the Gospels and Acts and the Epistles, and that forms its own canon. So we have the New Testament, or the New Testament canon. Um, and, so, and then that is closed, so we don't add to the New Testament either. But a lot of people say, well, how did Moses know about Abraham and these things? 
and most people would say, well, the Holy Spirit revealed it to me. I'm not sure how much I'm I can sure talk Holy during Spirit this because it is a very technical lesson sure that that now that I think about it. Genesis is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Um, however, we know that there, if you read Genesis and you believe Genesis, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had information. They wrote Hebrew, uh, so they were different uh, text. Moses knew, was fluent in Egyptian, the language, the fighting systems, knew all about his people. Um, you know, and you can see different things throughout Genesis sure. that they had traditions and ideas way before uh, Moses came along. So, according to the Essenes, then, there is a, a testament, if you will, or a collection of books that are just historical, but they're yeah, the testaments to, of the sure. patriarchs. And they're called that because um, the basic idea is, uh, I, when I get ready to die, I will do a last will and testament. And in, in English, or in America anyway, uh, the concept really is just, who, which kids do I want my, to give my stuff to? Maybe my son is bad, I don't want him to have anything. My daughter's good, I want her to get it all, or vice versa. Or how do I want it divvied up? That kind of thing. Well, in the Hebrew sense, that's there too. Who gets the, the blessing and the birthright and things like that? What I want to see done. These are uh, my commands. It doesn't to show my that kids. I have any viewers. Make sure Did you the follow video direction. Close out or something? But it's also got a lot of history to it in a family moral sense. It doesn't show that uh, I have one, any one viewers that it might say, out I, I messed up with alcohol. I thought it was all fun and games. Boy, did I make some mistakes. Loved ones are dead because of me. Don't make those mistakes. And they'll go explain things like that. And one testament is going to say, I thought I was huh. serious about it and I did not do those things. And boy, am I glad I did. So there's a lot of moral teachings in the testaments. But then there's also a section in almost all of them that talk about prophecy. They all knew the basics of the coming Messiah. And that's really interesting. So uh, when you look at weird. this then, as a Christian, watching. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to listen to the oral to Torah of the, Essene, or the uh, Pharisees and see if it matches the New Testament. And we find out it doesn't. Uh, in many crazy. times, like the virgin birth and the Messiah being just a general, just a guy, you know, not God incarnate, etc. I look at the testaments of the patriarchs, which the Essenes, who are called 100% accurate what prophets, indicate that they believe these to be legitimate. Now, oh, everything is a copy. You know, what we have, say, for the testament of, or not the testament, like the... Uh, uh, Habakkuk, the minor prophet. How do I know for sure it hasn't been tampered with? Well, what we have is a copy of a copy of a copy. And all evidence indicates it hasn't been tampered with. But we don't have originals. Uh, There's no way that now? we can know for sure. I mean, absolutely, concretely testing, proved. Testing, testing, And it's like that with everything. I'm, I'm and that's testing, why you've got to go through a testing, system of checks and balances when you're trying to determine how any manuscript is real. So it's going to be the same with all this. There's no way you, you hear can me prove like, Moses you hear me didn't well, say something just not hear me that, and it got handed situation. down correctly to the uh, Pharisees or that the patriarchs didn't correctly do that or that they're all garbled or whatever. Except as a Christian, Soft. I'm going to judge it all by the New Testament. Let me see. So if the New Testament disagrees with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, but agrees perfectly with what's I mean, written I'm, I'm, uh, in the Testaments of the Patriarchs, I'm inclined to believe that's true. Now, a skeptic would say, well, it's easy. This stuff was made up in the Middle Ages. Okay, that's a possibility. Uh, unless, of course, you find documents okay, that everybody agrees again. is, me, like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, do this BC, again. Hold on. in which case there's no way it's made. It could be made up by the scenes, but it can't be tampered with or made up by Christians. And basically all that would prove is that we didn't lie, we didn't make anything up, we inherited the concepts from the Essenes. So no matter how you look at it, it puts Christianity in a whole new light. We need to really seriously look at the New Testament. Not the Catholics or the Baptists or the whatevers, That's, they could very easily be weird, they're 2,000 years afterwards. But the documents is what we want to look at. So, in this and with this in mind, we're going to.
look at this we're not going to add to the scriptures we're just going to say that there are prophets and there are um, people that existed before Moses they wrote stuff that stuff is collected and kept among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Why would These you need to apologize for that? Very, very important, at least secondary doctrine. Much like we would look at the early church fathers, the disciples of the apostles. Um, if the daughters of Philip had written anything, or Agabus had written anything, like a book of prophecy. Ah, I hear my voice. You know they're real prophets. Do you hear it? So you should Max. hear it too, right? So I would like to look at that kind of thing. But again, it's the same thing. Did it get tampered with? Is it totally Yeah, technology fictitious? is annoying. Even if they wrote something, is this really what they wrote? And that would be kind of hard to absolutely prove, unless it agrees with Scripture, has accurate prophecy that comes to pass <laughs> on its own, oh, or disagrees with Scripture. Then you know it's fake. So those are the kind of things we want to look at with all of these. So let me take a look at this then. So this concept of the patriarchs... Um, we wrote a book a few years ago called The Testaments of the Patriarchs. So let me give you just a little bit of general information. Uh, first off, when I was in college, we went through, we studied lots of manuscripts. The Arminian Church has in their Old Testament, they, each one of the Orthodox churches seems to have an extra book or something. Right now he's talking about the, the Testaments of the Patriarchs, which are the Jewish to, Patriarchs. It's nice when they pres things get preserved that way and not tampered with. Well. In theirs, they have the, the teachings that were what's supposed to be handed down to the Jewish people, not the teachings and as you can of the see oral here, Torah and I Pharisees. If we, yeah, maybe I can't. Let me get out of this here. But there's the testament of uh, this, the 12 sons of Jacob. So here's Jacob here. You've got Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Joseph, and Benjamin. Those are the twelve we know from Genesis. The, the Pharisees plucked all those teachings of out of the so there's this collection teachings because the of the fact that they were all messianic the, the in nature. Twelve patriarchs, and it reports to be their last the, Old yeah, Testament. To the their Dead kids. Sea Scrolls were what the well, Essenes, the Arminian Church the uh, story, the had, story and the Essenes believed is that was the true way, and it was because they were accurate prophets, accurate prophets Essenes that were back in the first century. persecuted by the Essenes at the time of Christ. I mean, by the by the Pharisees at the time of Christ hidden in the caves around Judea. And supposedly somebody, this is Middle Ages, you know. They were like the pre-Christ Christians, so. basically. Somebody comes up and says, I was digging Proto -Christians, in the Proto-Christians, I guess you could call the Judean them. area, found these scrolls. So they give them to the Armenian church. The Armenian church looks at them, looks at history, says, we believe these things are real. Translates yeah, the Dead Sea Scroll story Greek is incredible. And puts it in their Greek their Old Testament. John the Baptist was and in a scene. that's where we get it from. Well, today, skeptics would say, well, if you read it, it's way too Christian. Either they made yeah, the whole story Yeah, that's the thing, is that all of these old Jewish writings that the that Essenes kind of had it, you know, were all very Christian and messianic kind of in nature. And that's always a possibility. So the stuff when that I asked the Jews professor believe in about today it, is like, all based off of Pharisee doctrine no as, prove or disprove you know, it. false doctrine, it's basically. Not, you can't really use it to witness. So... It's nice, but it's uh -huh. useless. Um, then, with the Dead Sea Scrolls coming along, though, pieces of these are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that only proves number yeah, the one, Dead Sea Scroll pretty the much puts the bed the issue that Jesus us wasn't true. the Messiah. And, and the fragments that it proved that beyond a reasonable doubt uh, equal, like you know, as far as scripture and historical and evidence versions goes. in the Armenian uh, canon. So all it tells us is that someone really did find Dead Sea Scrolls in the Middle Ages from the Qumran area somewhere and bring them to the church. The church translates them probably fairly faithful into Greek, puts it in their canon, and the rest is history. But what's interesting about it, knowing this story, it's not just the 12 sons of Jacob. Supposedly, the patriarchs, and that's from Adam to Aaron, were basically going through yeah, this Adam is in Adam the first who age. ate the apple. And then when uh, when Levi comes along, Levi actually, uh, the things switch. We had a Melchizedekian priesthood, which is a king, prophet, priest combination. And Jacob, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, according to the scrolls, breaks up the priesthood, the Melchizedekian priesthood, and creates a priesthood of which it's given to Levi. So you'd have to be a descendant of Levi to be a priest. 
a kingship given to Judah, so you have to be a descendant of Judah to be a king, and then a prophet line, and that gets, that's kind of mysterious, but that, that gets us into the school of the prophets and Elijah, and we have a lot more information now than we used to on that stuff, but that's kind of what happens, but that first 2,000 years or better, we, during the Melchizedekian priesthood era, king-priest combination, from Adam to Aaron, basically, uh, they each have a last will and testament. And they have a lot of interesting moral things in them and some very fascinating prophecies. 90% of which are first coming prophecies. So to us, we don't get it from them. I knew that. Oh, the game's Not a bit too loud. But it's a big deal if you think about it being written before the New Testament's written. And if Old Testament prophets understood Old Testament the way that the New Testament writers understood it, that is a huge deal. And then plus the fact that I'm really interested in is that that's not as I know about the first coming. What kind of second coming prophecies are there? And there are some interesting ones, that's for sure. Uh, very few by comparison to the first. So let me just look at this. So, Supposedly, then, if you just grab Genesis, for instance, we know that there's Adam, Enos, uh, Adam, Seth, Enos, Adam, Halil, uh, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, ah. Isaac. Anyway, the ten patriarchs pre-flood. And then if you go from Noah to Shem, all the way down to Abraham, there are ten patriarchs. And then there's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob's kids. <laughs> So I want you to, to That's, uh, one thing. The so, giant. All of these guys would have had testaments. As far as what was actually found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a piece of the Testament of Enos. So that's cool. Think about this. That's Adam's grandson. A piece of a testament that the Essenes hmm. believed. No oh, way hey. to prove this is true or fake, but the Essenes believed it to be legitimate. It seems would you like to know what Enos learned about it from Adam about the coming Messiah. That is interesting. Anyway, and then there's Lamech and Noah. So we've had several of these. Abraham, uh, nothing from Isaac, but there should be one. Jacob, and then there's 12 sons of Jacob, which are all these here. But I want to draw your attention down here. Yeah, the story about the Essenes um, is incredible. Like, so they Levi were 100% gets the accurate prophets for and God. According to and the scrolls, he like gets all of the years ancient of peace. histories. The books and the they fathers, were horribly persecuted by the Pharisees, kind of stuff, the same people forms. that persecuted so Jesus. So Levi preserves them. And they were all, Levi you know, gives sounding the alarm, saying the, son, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. Is and, right you know, here. they had access to so all of these uh, Kohath, Amram, testaments of the Jewish and patriarchs. Amram, and uh, fathers, testaments all Moses, dating all the way back to Adam. Adam. Now, Moses writes tons of stuff, like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There actually is a testament of Aaron which, if we believe the Essenes, is actually written by the first ironic, er, ironic high priest. Not ironic, Aaron, Aaron, the Levitical priesthood. But isn't that interesting? And we're going to talk about some of these. Some of these things have some very, very interesting things. I wanted to give you that as an outline, though. So in this book, we've got an introduction talking about all that kind of stuff, what happened. And there's a chart here I want to share you, with you. Um, yeah, there's actually several. Okay, so Dead Sea Scroll Testaments. So again, the, well, the no, Testaments he, he of the 12 Patriarchs. Well, no, he explained this a lot better in the beginning, the but like, I, I don't think I streamed in the canon. beginning. It's in Greek. We don't know if it's been tampered with or not, but the pieces that do match the pieces that are in the Dead Sea Scrolls are identical, so that's cool. But in addition to this, we have the Testament of Enosh, which is only found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's Dead Sea Scroll 4Q369. And then pieces of the Book of Enoch, it's similar or identical, except the numbers are different. When you get to the Ethiopian canon, Enoch and Jubilees, everything seems to be pretty good. Yeah. Numbers Don't are worry always about it. It's a very technical subject. Even into Greek. The numbers get I've only up, I only like understand as much as I do because I've listened anyway, to this stuff a piece for of the testament hours of upon hours upon That's dozens 1Q20 of hours. That's one Q twenty and four Q five thirty five, and how this works again is the Q means it was Qumran, and K one to twelve is the first number. So this is K four 
uh, 4Q369. It's the 369th fragment or scroll oh. that was found in Cave 4. I got grabbed. So Ow. when we get to Testament of Abraham, that's 1Q20. Uh, Testament of Jacob. Yeah, the, the Dead Sea Scroll stuff is. Oh, uh, 4Q537. The Dead Sea Testament Scrolls of Levi like, is discovered like. Amazing. Little less anyway, than a century ago. No. Part of the Testament of Judah, the 70s, Naphtali, and Benjamin. 60s. Those are, so we you know, still, the kids. it's taken a lot of time then, to. The Testament you know, of Kohath, Amram, about. and Aaron. And I think these are kind of important for us to look at. I have Jewish friends that actually believe, for instance, the Testament of Noah is written by Noah, and Amram written by Amram, things like that. And it's like, then read it, consider that it might actually be totally true. And if it is, what would that mean for you and me today? Well, when you look at the prophecies about the coming Messiah, it makes a difference. It's deep. Super it's deep. fine to be told by the rabbis that Christians are wacky, don't pay any attention to them. Well, the thing okay, is, is that fair. like a lot of people don't trust the apocryphal stuff because there is like the, some Gnostic rabbis, heresies laced in. I don't think any Gnostic stuff was the found say. in the uh, and even in Dead some Sea cases, but there's you definitely you a lot of to. Gnostic heresy. They're going to change this. Some They're people are mistaken as, as authoritative gospel. Now again, gospel, it's an in-house sadly. debate, like a Baptist versus a Catholic. But the and they have different basically the right, apocryphal knows, works, just like cares, anything yeah. else on this planet, but can be tested by that, scripture. And the and kind of, of sudden, stuff that you realize Ken Johnson it's basically fine for does the Catholic a really good job of one thing running through slam the what passes the scripture test and what doesn't, what's Gnostic heresy and what isn't. But for That's, one of them to one of my kind of cover up sure. the fact there never was a Catholic, there never was a Baptist, and then tell you if you read anything about this kind of stuff, you'll be cursed, so don't even go go there. Wait, wait, There's wait, tons what? of cults all over. What makes this cult so bad that you had to try to erase its very existence? Something's not right. Uh, yeah, that's what give me one sec. I realize. actually had to take it's the like, dog out, so, so I had to pause him out. Anyway, give me a second. I mean, so they were messianic. If they would have said it's a wacky group, Christians probably came from them. They're all nuts. Okay, that's an opinion.
you hear me? Are you still watching it or? Oh, my butt hurts. Because if you're like eating and stuff, I'm just gonna like play the game but not like start the stream. I'm gonna start the, uh, you know, um, the Ken Johnson study. But, uh, and if you if you want to go to bed, let me know. Like you know, it's not a big deal. Do it some other time. Can you hear me? Like, am I, uh... Can, like, are you still listening to the stream? Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, I missed your message about the... Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm kind of hungry myself. Um... Yeah, like, I don't know, I just learned a lot, and it's all thanks to God, I, I'm nothing without him, he's amazing, and perfect, and awesome, all glory goes to him. Whew. I got some little, uh, I bought some heart, they're called harvest snaps, they're baked red lentil snacks, they're actually really good. They're fr um, they're fried in canola oil though, but they're generally pretty low calorie and high protein. I think they they usually put them. I think they usually put them on. Uh, glory be to God. I think they usually put them on salads, but I don't know. They taste good eating them like chips. Yeah, it's like a chip type snack made out of lentils. Welcome home, my shaman. Speak thine heart's desire. Oh man, three days in a row, babe. Like I'm, I'm, I, f I feel great. Very well. I know it's then time to the uh, work morning. out because around the time that I got to, it's like I start feeling a little depressed. Like I need to get up and move. What do you want, Jet? I just gave you attention and a snack. Get out of my face. Get out of my face.
This this flavor I don't like the plain ones. They're gross. Um, but these ones are tomato basil. They're really really good. <laughs> you wait, you so you didn't you didn't go eat? Oh, you didn't go work out? So you're not gonna <coughs> excuse me. Ugh. You're not gonna go eat. Go eat. Okay, yeah, go do that. Uh are you gonna be away from the computer? Ooh, wings. A little piece of the uh, crumb from the um, the the snacks I was eating kind of choked me. Oh, okay, cool. I'm on your phone. Um, man, I just I I want to get into a position in my life where I can say that I love the Lord and not be a liar. Like I love the Lord and it it shows in my actions, you know, and behavior. And I'm I'm like I think binging on teachings and, and and just trying to commit it all to memory really does a, a good job of helping me get towards that goal. I mean, I know I'm never going to be perfect and I shouldn't beat myself up when I fall short, but you know what I mean? Like, there's just days like today where I feel like I'm on fire and, uh, and I just thank the Lord for it. You know, he's amazing. I've been getting better about, you know, working out, and I don't know. Ah, almost choked myself again. Hmm. Yeah, but I, I don't think you should ever beat yourself up for that. You should only just, you know, ask the Lord for forgiveness and move on and do better. You know, He doesn't want us... Uh, I, I'm not saying you have. I, I I don't really know the contents on of your heart on these matters specifically, but you know he doesn't want us beaten. <laughs> I don't know. I get too excited and I talk and eat all the time and choke myself to death. But you know he just wants us to get up and pull ourselves up by the bootstrap bootstraps and you know press forward. Oh, you might think this part is gross. These games are spooky. Spooky. <sighs> and I'll be here to encourage you, sweetie. I'll be here to help you learn. And to learn myself, you know, we, we got to do this together. Yep, it was cranberry juice. You got it. 
<laughs> I like I love dark sa dark fantasy video games, but like like you know sometimes I do have to be like uh for you know my fellow Christian people I gotta be like disclaimer, you know. <laughs> If I can, let's see if I can beat this guy. Oh. oh. Triggered. <laughs> well, like you know, that's the thing is that I've had. Like with a lot of video games and comics and stuff that I used to like, and still current, some of them I still currently do. I've really had to, I've really had to sharpen my discernment, because like there are some times when I'm like, okay, like are these writers using the, this like you know, this mythology like say Norse mythology or something? Are they using it simply to tell a, a cool story? Are are they are did they create something that is a monument to the, you know, their their affection for this ideology or this uh, mythology? You know what I'm saying? And and I don't think I don't think God appreciates me taking part in the latter because uh, you know I I don't want to reward the labors of people who create things that my Lord hates, um, with with glee. But if it's just people who are who think it's just a cool, uh, you know, set of stories to base story writing off of, like you know, I don't really see too much of an issue on it. Like my discernment doesn't really seem to be screaming out at me all that much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because there's a lot of them. There's a lot of people that. Um, create these things as a way to get people into the occult you know what I'm saying like Doctor Strange the movie I always use that as a good example um, but in the Dark Souls series like believe it or not so you know it's 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 typical like fantasy uh, based off of like you know various mythologies of the world but it's actually yeah 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 same here but the Dark Souls series actually depicts the the exploits of the gods of this world very realistically compared to what they are, you know, like, they depict them as, as evil and oppressive and degenerates and, you know, not really good characters, whereas something like, say, uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is more like, man, Norse mythology is cool, yeah, heck yeah, Norse mythology, you know, positive... That's, you know, that's something cool to believe in. You know what I'm saying? Whereas here, it definitely, it definitely doesn't glorify those kinds of stories. So it's the difference between just using it as like a story, a storytelling, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it rather than using, rather than glorifying, I think, a lot of like mythology of, of the world, I, I, I feel okay playing fantasy games where they merely use them as like a stage setter you know what I'm saying I say you know what I'm saying a lot <laughs> I guess because I ramble a lot and I gotta make sure people are keeping up with me <clears throat> the what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm just trying to be more judicious, maybe that's not the right word, about where I put my money and attention in terms of, like, my hobbies because I know that sometimes I could potentially be financially enriching with my purchase someone who hates my god. You know what I'm saying? Rather than, you know, putting my... Uh, yeah.
Yeah, and it's 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 definitely like been a been like a I don't know, kind of been helping me sharp sharpen my discernment, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I I think I've got to kind of maybe s do some more research on one of my favorite game designers because I, th like, he's made, like, a ton of, like, video games that I really love, but also I think that his love for Gnosticism is more than just as a, st a stage setting device for his writings. Um... I want to do more research on him because I think he might actually like, you know, the teachings of Gnosticism. And there, when when that happens, there's always a chance that his creations are more like a a, a monument glorifying, you know, these beliefs that beliefs that my God hates. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's really I I I have had to practice a lot of discernment and um, you know get to the bottom of the the issue, I guess. Ah. Like in the Dark Souls series, they always depict the occult, the occult arts as being inherently bad for you, <laughs> and and the uh, and the occult practitioners being very sketchy individuals, and they always depict all these polytheistic gods as being really awful and oppressive and degenerate, even um, like sexually and and morally degenerate. So I don't know. I think that's actually the right message concerning these things, rather than some. Rather than like something like Harry Potter, where it's like, oh, witchcraft is good, actually. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, that's that's what I've been doing and I think it's helped me a lot too because like, you know, I just don't And you know, I I'm not perfect. I hope I really haven't made any any horrible mistakes in my judgment, but I don't know. I feel like I feel like hey, <laughs> bonfire lit. Um I feel like my discernment is in a pretty decent at a pretty decent level in terms of like, you know, real RPG terminology. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've leveled up quite a bit in terms of how I understand these things. And I know when dark agendas are being pushed upon me. You know what I'm saying? Ah, oh, I keep saying that. I hate it. I know, like, uh, nowadays I feel like I know much better when someone's simply trying to tell me a story and when somebody's trying to push an agenda on me. Because, you know, religious uh, and occult agendas aren't even the only kind of agendas that are being pushed by, like, you know, creators who create, I don't know, movies or video games. Sometimes there's, like, feminist agendas. Sometimes there's wicked progressive agendas that they're trying to push, like, you know, embrace... Uh, homosexuality or you're uh, are you an awful person you know what I'm saying oh, I said it again but yeah I think with fantasy games specifically and sci-fi there's definitely a lot of uh, yeah all kinds of agendas but with fantasy in particular there's lots of like a lot of uh, glorification of the occult rather than simply using ah using these things as a story going ah damn dang sorry right up the play whoa this game is hard if you couldn't tell yeah ow <laughs> well, thank you, sweetie, because, like, I, when I ramble a lot, um, I tend to lose focus, and I, I constantly have to ask if people are keeping up with me. Mm. 
Yeah, same, same. Um, they try to repackage a lot of really dark things as love. I actually have a lot of sympathy for anyone besides you who's watching me right now and hearing me ramble, ramble about uh, my, my Christian beliefs. Oh, good. That's good to know. Cause like I really go fast. I go so fast sometimes that I lose myself. I forget what I'm talking about. So whoever you are, second viewer, uh, I will not apologize for my Christian beliefs. <laughs> Hehe. Hi -hi. Enjoy the show. I'm terrible at this game. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Did you see how strong those barricades were? Come on, man, jump down. Bro, you just gonna sit up there? Oh, now he's coming. <laughs> oh, I thought that was supposed to parry. I timed that perfectly. Oh, crap. Why they make that? Because this is dark fantasy and all the enemies are abominations. <laughs> oh hey, I forgot about this. Distasteful? Yeah, probably. You making your sandwich? What kind of sandwich you making? <sighs> My fire lit. kind of pumped right now. I feel good. I worked out today. Um, I witnessed a lot. 
toasted, huh? How does that taste? The raisin cinnamon bread on on a sandwich like that. I like that I like that brand, but I never thought about using it for sandwiches. I wonder if I should use spears at some point. Hmm. I like the Lothric Knight Long Spear. Look at how big that thing is. It is! That's what he was stabbing me with just now. so bad. No, no, no. Don't do that to me. being sneaky. Yeah, the last guy I just kept mistiming all my heals and rolls, so he was uh, punishing me pretty bad for that. Isn't there supposed to be an item here? 
bonk. Yeah, that's just the nature of this game. Like, sometimes you get frazzled by enemies and you start making a lot of mistakes. It's very... It's a very, like, if you make mistakes, you die easily kind of game. Oh, man, I hate this next part. Hmm. <laughs> Whoa! This is an angry boy. Oh, I'm scary. Yep. Come on. Well, this Dark Souls 3 annoys me a lot because, uh, oh no, I have four viewers now. Please, everybody, stop watching me. Not only am I embarrassing, but I'm talking crazy talk. Um. Yeah, I, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh. So, like, Bloodborne came out, and that was uh, another one of these games. And it, and it was, like, centered around, like, really fast, super duper fast combat. And then this game came out, and they tried to Bloodborneify the bosses and make them really fast, but you still kind of control like a, a clunky Dark Souls character. And I know this terminology doesn't mean anything to you because... Well, because... guys <clears throat> these guys are called outrider knights and they are a pain in the butt hmm. all right up here. I dare you. Come on. Oh, got him. Seeing that three, that that three viewer indicator up in the top right corner makes me really nervous because I don't know. Maybe I'm not cut out for streaming. Look at that. It's an ugly dragon. <laughs> I 
I killed the Outrider Knight at least. I got killed by dragon fire. See those two dragons up there? Yeah, they killed me. I gotta run past all these guys. Oh man! Oh! Alright, I'm just running, 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 running. What's so pretty? The dragons? I mean, if undead dragons are your thing, I guess so. Nice, I only have one viewer now. I guess they got the hint. Sorry folks, I'm just I'm not I'm not cut out to be an entertainer. Scream my screen? Did I scream? I wouldn't be surprised if I did. These games are scary. their way into my breathing hole. Oh yeah. <clears throat> that enemy I killed, the one that screams, it like alerts all the other enemies. So all those enemies I just killed would have been chasing after me. Like five of them. <clears throat> and big groups of enemies like that ganging up on you are, uh, are really dangerous <clears throat> in this game. Are you forklift certified? <laughs> oh, what? Oh, what? No. If I'm what I don't even remember what I just said because I just got oh forklift certified. <coughs> I asked if you were forklift certified. Yeah. Uh. Ooh. <laughs> My baby's forklift certified. Oh yeah.
I had those black fire bombs. Uh, I just killed the one dragon. <clears throat> so these dragons are like, kind of like, I don't know the lore, the, the 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 background lore behind it, but they're kind of like ashen husks. They're like just ash, uh, completely calcified bodies. But it looks kind of like they're controlled by like some kind of dark substance that you just saw me kill and this dragon disappeared. <laughs> but don't you see how the dragons are all like calcified and ugly look? They're like ash. They're pure ash. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't think you would. <laughs> but yeah, like the story of these games is that like um <clears throat> like in the beginning there was like a uh oh man, I'm going to butcher the lore so bad. <clears throat> there was like a first flame and the gods of this world like I don't know, kindled the flame or something. Man, it's been so long since I watched the um, <laughs> the lore for these games. And the flame kind of just like kept living things living in this in this world, you know? And the flame kind of dies every so often, like thousands of years or something like that. And then the world kind of decays and it needs to be rekindled by the gods or whatever. Um... And, uh, <clears throat> basically, you come in at the very end, at, at an end, end times sort of age, where the gods have all, like, decayed themselves, and you got to, uh, take up their mantle and, and like, rekindle the flame yourself. <clears throat> I really butchered the lore, but... It's, I think it's just interesting because they depict the gods as evil and oppressive and degenerate as they, they are in, you know, various mythology, polytheistic mythologies like, you know, Norse mythology or Greek mythology. <clears throat> so it's definitely not an endorsement of, like, polytheistic religion, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> Interesting. <clears throat> this part's gonna suck. Okay. This is gonna suck. <laughs> Oh. 
<clears throat> oh wait, no. Ow, no. Big boy. Oh, ow. He attacked me through the wall. Coming? <sighs> I like using katanas. I'm an authentic Japanese samurai. Isn't that amazing? Aren't you impressed? Konnichiwa. I'm surprised somebody besides you has been watching me all this time. Whoever it is probably thinks I'm crazy because they don't know who I'm talking to. Uh, I did talk to myself a little bit, but welcome back. <clears throat> How embarrassing. You embarrassed me, Ariola. I can never forgive you. Yeah, I was just saying that I'm surprised that there's been a viewer besides you that's actually been watching me this nearly this whole time. 
I don't know who they are, but I, I feel pity for them. Listening to my crazy rantings, not knowing who the heck I'm talking to right now. <coughs> I had four viewers at one point. That's the most I've ever had. Uh, well, I have Dark Souls 3 in the title. Ah! Dark Souls 3 is still a pretty popular video game, so somebody probably just saw Dark Souls. Oh, crap. Bad. I'm just very bad right now. I wouldn't mind streaming for others. I just, um, I stream literally just for you, just so you can watch me and we can talk. And that's, that's the enjoyment I get out of it. Um, <clears throat> I kind of wish I knew how, yeah, I did. I did die. I kind of wish I knew how to make like a private stream. I don't really know how to do it to where only you can watch me. Um, I wouldn't mind streaming for an audience, but like, I en the, what I enjoy about streaming the most is talking to you while I do it, so. Ah! Oh man. Oh! All that skill, skill. Oh no, that's not skill. <laughs> oh, he got healed. All right, I'm resetting this. This is bogus. Bogus. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's not hard to find out how I could just do a stream for you, but, but, um, I just, I mean, I think I just make it private and then I go into my settings and get the link, but I don't really know how to do that because I'm streaming from GeForce experience and I don't really know how to do that from, or if I have to even do, I don't know. I'm like a novice when it comes to streaming. Oh man, come on. Oh. No way. That was perfectly caught. Oh, great. I hate this game. All right, you know what? I'm just going to run past these guys. <laughs> Screw this. Sorry, I didn't see the last thing you said. Let's see. We'll figure it out. Yeah, I mean, usually I fight those guys just fine. I just, um, I don't remember how to, because, like, <clears throat> sometimes the enemies are set up to where you have to approach the situation kind of methodically. Like, right there, I don't really know how to get, how, quite how to get to the, um, the little cleric guy that's making, that's healing the knights that are fighting me and making them, sh and, and buffing them. I don't quite know how to take him out fast enough that he does it. He's not able to do that. I don't use arrows or anything, so. Oh, oh this sucks. Oh, 
There goes the other dragon. Yeah, I just, um, I don't usually run, like, faith decks. Like, I, I pumped my stats into faith and dexterity, so I do, like, miracles and throw lightning and stuff. This is a mimic. I hate mimics. Yeah, I usually go like uh, strength intelligence, so I'm like a spellcaster, and and I and I hit enemies with big ol' heavy weapons. <laughs> I hate. Yeah, the mimics are gross. I mean, look at them. It's a chest with teeth and gangly limbs, and they eat you. I keep mistiming my parries. Basically, you can parry enemy attacks, and if they, if you catch them, they are vulnerable, and you can execute them. Ah, damn it! Oh, I'm out of. Come on, overhead attack. Overhead attack, please. No, I mi mistimed it again. Overhead attack, me, please. Please? Ah, I keep mistiming it. I'm so bad. I'm honestly not all that bad at, at, at parrying, but I'm bad tonight because I'm trying to impress you. I guess I can kill him. Just gotta stop with the stupid parrying. Whoa. Oh, this guy is messing me up bad. I'm just running. How did I get my butt kicked by a Lothric Knight? That's so depressing. Ah, I lost my other viewer. Whew! Oh no. Oh no, he followed me. <laughs> my elite gamer skills impress you? Hear me chewing? How embarrassing.
Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't normally delete these videos, so this is gonna get posted. Me uh, doing mukbang ASMR, I guess. Yeah, true. True facts, my darling. Oh, this elevator's taking forever. And uh, I noticed that we've forgotten completely about the study. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't want to have to get up to ta tap out and restart the study, but I'm, I'm having fun. I'm having fun just talking to you, and I'll, I'll probably just study later, like after you go to bed. Like, that's why I really didn't restart it, just because you were going to bed. <clears throat> good yeah I'm always afraid that like these games might be a little too dark for you but I mean like I think you know that I I don't in I think you know me well enough and that how vigilant I am to practice my discernment and what I consume in my eyes and and with my spend money on <laughs> I can't word things very well that I'm not I'm trying I'm, I'm not subjecting you to anything that's that's an endorsement of demonic activity. Oh. Wow. Man, my lightning spears don't take away anything at all. Okay, well that's good. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'm still trying to figure out what comics and games I like, cause, like I said, like I, 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 I try to re-enjoy some of the things I used to enjoy before I was saved sometimes, and I definitely get a feeling like it's not kosher, like it's not something God would be wanting me to take part in, and. It's kind of like a painful separation sometimes because some of these games I grew up on and enjoyed a lot. Uh, comics, like mm, usually just manga. I, I don't really, I don't really read Western comics. Yeah, like I mean. I shouldn't complain because I know it's just the Holy Spirit keeping me safe. Um, and you know, in fact, I will rebuke what I just said. Like, I don't, I don't mean to make it sound very complainy. Like, it's a painful separation, but it's definitely necessary. Painful separation sometimes, anyway. See, there was a counter. You saw how you all saw how skilled I am? Take that. It is, it is. Like I I do wanna I mean uh, I do wanna make sure that I, I spend as little time as possible doing things that God doesn't like. And I'm a gamer, that's my hobby, so that means curating that means curating uh, what I take in, you know, what I allow through my eyes and experiences. Gamer teams. Mm. Oh, hey, it's Morn. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 of course you understand. Like, I, 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 
I apologize. I keep forgetting to give you credit because you're on this same, you know, journey that I am. You know, you're constantly finding yourself having to, you know, separate yourself from movies and stuff that have, you know, bad occult or uh, demonic messaging. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing my best. Um... I'm not perfect at it, but I'm learning to listen more and more. Um, I'm definitely learning to listen to it more and more concerning matters of witnessing. Like sometimes I'll see a post on Facebook and 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 I'll and 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 my fleshy human side wants to be like, "Ugh, just let him be." But the Holy Spirit's like, "No, say something. You know, say something in loving rebuke." Don't be don't be don't be spiteful about it, but but let them know that what they're doing or is not okay, or the way they think is not okay, you know. And tell them why clearly. Huh. <sighs> you know what I'm saying. Like, there are times when the flesh wants to avoid conflict, I guess, is the way to... Is the way to put it. But I feel like I have pretty good bedside manner in... Meaning that, like, when I do find a, a situation where I feel like I have to step up and speak for my God... Uh, I do it as gently as possible, you know? I do it as gently but as sternly as possible. Oh yeah, I forgot you could hear me, uh, chew. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I know that when I get up to the beam of seat of Christ, there's going to be a lot... <laughs> there's going to be a lot he's going to bring up to me that I, it's going to make me cringe and feel awful that I, you know, certain things that I've done in my life, but, like, I, I want to go up there and make sure that I do get rewarded for a lot of the things I did and rewarded for the attitude I have, I had in the face of, uh, you know, wrongdoings. Welcome home, Russian one. Speak thine heart's desire. Very well, then Tuck take nourishment from you. <laughs> Farewell, Ashen One Maiden. I don't know what weapon to use for the next boss. Oh, you... the game character, maybe? Well, I've got a giant sword or two. <laughs> How about this one? Bonk. I've got this one. I love this one. Bonk. 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 <laughs> Uh, I want to see what he's weak to, actually. <clears throat> uh. <sighs> huh. Okay. I think, um... Yeah, alright, this weapon's gonna be good for him. Look how impractical this attack is. <laughs> That's so crazy. What seems so lonely?
<laughs> right? I've never fought the the boss I'm about to fight with uh, big weapons like this before. I might do really poorly. My character is a female. How dare you misgender her? Oh yeah, you know that's actually something I've always liked about this series is like I always kind of liked like I guess in, for the same reason like people like horror movies I've always liked the isolation aspect of these games like you're in a ruined world there's very few people you can trust very few people who are actually like sentient and and cognitively aware everybody else is going like hollow and feral and like all these people that I'm fighting they're all senseless and just violent whoa man Oh, stop walking! What? Stop! But no, I just, I've just always thought that was uh, really cool. Kind of like heroic in a way that your characters in such, such miserable circumstances, but they keep pressing on in this dead world against all odds, against all these creatures and monsters and feral people that want to kill you. So what happens at the end of this game? They have a... They usually have a few different endings, um, so it's hard to say definitively, like, what happens. What the heck is going on there? I'm gonna try to solo him, but it might not go very well. I mean, I've soloed him before. Big boy. Oh, I do a lot of damage. Oh, it's... Oh, no! Crap. Oh man, I'm so bad right now. Uh, I don't use this weapon very often, so I don't... I'm kind of confused as to how to approach him. Yeah, I was doing so bad because I just don't remember how to use this weapon. All of the weapons have like very different move sets, so it's like I've actually just been using the um, what is it? The um, the katana for a long time. The the black blade. That's what you've been seeing me using. It's got a nice quick move set. <clears throat> 
I actually prefer the bigger weapons, but I've been making a point to use uh, the katanas more. I gotta wait for the elevator again. I need a gun that shoots fire. They have those in Bloodborne. Bloodborne is like this, but it's more like, uh, uh, what's the proper century I'm thinking of? 19th century, like, foggy London setting, and the story is, like, very H.P. Lovecraftian. Yeah, I love Bloodborne. That one might be too... That game might be too creepy for you. Oh. That's hard to say. Bloodborne's a, a, a masterpiece, a work of art. I think I like Bloodborne more than Dark Souls 3. Like, a lot more. But I like Dark Souls 3 a lot. You don't know me. Uh... Let's try this again. Oh, off to a bad start. How much it takes away with every attack is so crazy. Yeah, when I was running to him just now, I did that jumping attack by mistake because I forgot that the running R2 attack does a lunging attack. I wanted to do this instead. That would have ended him, but I didn't do that because I'm terrible. 
I was freaking out. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> I pity this other soul that's watching me. He's watching, he or she is watching me goof up a lot. I've beaten this guy just, I actually, not only have I beaten this guy like twice before, but I beat him a third time the other day on, on a different character. Oh, okay, you're getting sleepy? Sorry for chewing into the mic. I'm fine. Today, but the stuff I'm about fine. the history, like the Damascus Covenant, the community rule, four Q instruction, things like that, that paints a very interesting picture. Again, it's an alternate timeline of events. Which one's telling the truth, the Pharisees and the Sadducees or the Essenes? So very interesting. Well, we're just going to look at some of these, and I wanted to give that to you as a kind of introduction to the Testaments. 
So again, we have this concept that um, the Old Testament is started off by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then Joshua writes Joshua, and it goes on down. The canon is closed. There are things that happen in those 400 years between the Testaments, and it used to be called the Silent Years, Beaker is called the Silent Years, because it used to be we didn't have any history that wasn't garbled. And you can almost tell, I mean, when you're looking at the Talmud and other places, it would be this guy is named this. He ruled 20 years during the reign of so-and-so from here to here. Really specific, right? And then you get to that 400 silent years and you get stuff like it was a guy named Simon. It might have been his son or his cousin. We're not sure. Ruled about that time for a number of years. Somebody got mad at him and killed him. We're not sure why. You know, and it just goes on and it's like, something's not right. How can you be so specific all the way up to here and then from here forward, we're not sure what happened. You know, and then you get stuff like um, Satan along giving you some of the stories of what happened. It paints an interesting picture of an apostasy. It's a very, very fascinating study. But let's look at this for a second. So if we go back to this, um, the top, let's see here. So, so we're going to look at this. So theoretically, we would have Adam and Seth, Enos, Canaan, and on down. And we're going to see a, a little bit about it. One of the things I've mentioned to you before is I get stuck on little bitty things. So I'm reading Josephus, for instance, at one point, in the very beginning of Antiquity. And he makes a comment in one spot that says, it would be really tedious to name all the sons of Adam. So we're just going to name the patriarchs. And it starts when he goes Seth, you know, on down to Noah. And then it just goes on. This happened in the Cain and Abel deal, and, you know, and, but then there's a flood, and, and he goes on. And most people skip right over that. It's like, wait a minute. Just wait a minute. It would be too tedious for him to write the rest of the history. So he wants to give a quick synopsis and then go forward. You don't say it like that if it's like, I have no idea what happened. There's, you know, 29,000 books back there, and it would take me forever to go through them so that I could give you a detailed history. It's too tedious. I'm going to skip over that part. That's what you mean when you say it's too tedious. I'm going to skip over it. So you could, if you wanted to be tenacious about it, go ahead and do it. So that means in Josephus' day, 70 AD, there's still a bunch of chronological records, even pre-flood records, because that's what he said. You know, there's little, little hints like that all the way through. So I want to make mention of this, and we're going to focus on this. There's the first four patriarchs. There's Adam, Seth, uh, Enos, and Canaan. Right? So there's first four. So we don't have anything from Adam or Seth as far as like the patriarchal writing like mentioned here. But I do want to show you one thing. This is from our post flood Histories book. Go back pre-flood, and here's some interesting things. This is a text from uh, Josephus' Antiquities. Actually, let me read it from Josephus' Antiquities. And here is Josephus' Antiquities, Book 1, Chapter 2. So, just like, you know, five minutes into the book, he's talking about this stuff. So let's just read this one section, Chapter, Book 1, Chapter 2, Section 3. Just this one section here. It says, now, Adam, who was the first man, made out of the earth, for our discourse must now be about him. We've already covered basic creation. After Abel was slain, Cain fled away. We, we know that from Genesis. On account of his murder, uh, was solicitous for posterity, and had a keen desire for children. He began began 230 years old, from which time he lived another 700. So you can see here the numbers are off. It's not 130 and 800 years. It's 230 and 7 years. 
So we're taking the Septuagint version of the numbers. Other than that, the story is the same, but the numbers always change. Anyway, and when you look at the Genesis version of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it agrees with the regular version, not Josephus, but not important at this point. But anyway, he has children, Seth in particular. Okay. As for the rest, it would be too tedious to name them. Again, this is where I get off the rabbit trail. We talked about that, though. Anyway, so I will therefore only endeavor to give an account of those that preceded from Seth. Okay. Uh, for now, or for this Seth, when he was brought up and came to those years in which he could discern what was good, became a virtuous man. And he was himself of an excellent character. So did he leave children behind him who imitated his virtues. Now there's going to be Sethites and Cainites. It has nothing to do with Genesis 6, but it's an interesting story. There's actually a lot of pre-flood history on how things developed. So anyway, but this is what's interesting. It says, um, and his children imitated his virtues. All these proved to be of good dispositions. They also inhabited the same country without dissensions. So this is really cool. If you and I love the Lord, we can agree to disagree. And if you're being immoral, you're going to be asked to leave. I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to put you out of our community. We don't want that here. This is a Christian community or this is a... And so we want to live without strife. Nobody beating anybody up. No spousal abuse. No ch child abuse. Everything is watched. We're, we're a communal group. We follow the Lord. Herbal medicine. We don't do wars. It shouldn't really... It should be a pretty happy life, actually. So these pr proved to be good dispositions. They inhabited the same country without dissensions. In a happy condition, without any misfortunes falling on them until they died. So that's pretty good. Again, if you eat well, you don't have the cancers and the all the weird stuff, um, according to other scrolls. But this goes on and says, um, they were also the inventors of a particular sort of wisdom concerned with the heavenly bodies and their order, the calendar, the clocks, the, the uh, Maserat, so that their inventions may not be lost before they were sufficiently known. Now look at this. Upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed at one time by a force of fire, and in another time, by a violence and a quantity of water, they made two pillars. So I want you to see this now. There is a prediction made by Adam that the world would be destroyed twice. How could it be destroyed twice? But anyway, it's what the prophecy said. Once by water, once by fire. How does that work? I have no clue. If the entire planet's destroyed, how could we have people left over to get it destroyed again? But, you know, it's one of those mysteries. But it's interesting that he that he says this. So this gives us a, a, an understanding. This is not in scripture anywhere. So this is Josephus giving us a glimpse into Adam's testament. So it still existed as of 2,000 years ago. So because Adam predicted this and they were serious about it, they wanted the calendar and the systems to still be understood. They made two pillars, one out of stone and one out of brick. Now, why brick and then stone? They inscribed their discoveries on them both in the case that the pillar of brick would be destroyed by a flood. The pillar of stone might remain and exhibit those discoveries to mankind. So it's like the flood would wipe out one kind and, and the other kind would still be here. Water would not destroy the one, but would probably corrode, at least especially salt water, might erase all the stuff carved on the stone. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So one for fire, one for water. They were serious. They believed the prophecies. Uh, um, so uh, the, the, if, if destroyed by the flood, the pillar of stone might remain and exhibit those discoveries to mankind. 
and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick erected by them. Now, this pillar, it says, remains in the land of Sirad to this day. In 70 AD, or in that time period, there still was in the land of Sirad Seth's pillar. So a whole other study with some very interesting things about it, prophecy and other things too. But that's another study. For this, I just want you to see just in this one thing, there's a lot of stuff in here. Number one, he's saying there is a detailed account of pre-flood genealogies somewhere, but he ain't going to touch it. It'd be too tedious. Uh, and then we go with Seth and the Sethites being godly, and they invented a certain wisdom with the calendars. We studied the calendar system before. According to the Essenes, it's the same stuff, so we have that information. And that there's this uh, pillar. But I want you to see that. So Adam's prediction is the main thing. There was a testament of Adam that talked about a prediction of that. Now, let me go back to this here. This is from our, that's just from Josephus. This is from our uh, ancient history, or ancient prophecies reveal book. So here's the same thing. It's the quote of Josephus about, or part of it, about Adam's prediction. We just read that. So here is a section here, and this is kind of small because this is a bigger book. Let me just read it to you, the best I can do for this. Um, it says, this is a uh, quote from Jasher, chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. We've reproduced the book of Jasher, too, so it's out there. It says, Canaan, now remember, you've got Adam, Seth, Canaan, and then um, on down. He knows, yeah. And it says, Canaan grew up, and he was 40 years old, and he became wise and had knowledge and skill and all wisdom and reigned over the sons of men and held the sons of men and led the sons of men into wisdom and knowledge. And then it talks about some demonic stuff. And then it says, Canaan knew by his wisdom that God would destroy the sons of men for having sinned upon the earth and that the Lord would in the latter days bring upon them a flood of waters. And in those days Canaan wrote upon tablets of stone what was to take place in the time to come, and he put them with his treasures. So Canaan was able to figure out, uh, apparently Adam had told him that particular prophecy, Canaan was able to figure out the first one would be a flood of water. So he's writing on stone so that these things can be found. Now, according to a lot of the other texts, uh, Jasher, Jubilees, some of the scrolls, those texts were discovered post-flood, and some fascinating stories come from those. But this just gives us um, a couple of things. So apparently there is a um, testament of Adam, and not necessarily a testament of, of, of Seth, I would assume so, Testament of Enos, we're going to look at in a minute, and a Testament of Canaan. Adam and Canaan are the only, this is the only thing we know of them, but that proves that they existed. Now, we all know there was a flood, and like Peter said, if you know there was literally a flood, there's going to be a literal judgment of fire, so we need to work on being godly. Very, very important. So this doesn't tell us anything new other than the Testaments really did exist. And if they contradict scripture, they've been garbled. If they agree with scripture, they're fine. Especially if they agree with New Testament theology before the New Testament was even written. That's fascinating. So let me get out of here and we'll go back to here. I want to look at the Testament of Enos. This is only found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in one spot. It's 4Q369. So if you want to look that up, you can always go to the Israeli Antiquities site and in, in Google these things and get the actual scrolls. If you can read Hebrew, uh, just learn the Paleo-Hebrew, is it Paleo? I think it's Paleo-Hebrew in that case, uh, script. Much like, um, uh, it, it surprised me the other day, I had a friend who graduated high school and they never taught him cursive. It's like, how do you read the Founding Fathers? How do you know that we're not lying about the Constitution if you can't read it? You know, handwriting is kind of hard to read anyway, but, you know, you just got to learn the script. He knows English perfectly. So if you just learn the cursive language, you know, the, the letters, 
you can write. So it's the same with uh, with uh, Paleo Hebrew, Proto Hebrew, and, and the, some of the other variants. So anyway, so let's look at this. This, this is fragmented, but let's see what we can gather from the Testament of Enos. It talks about the mysteries, and this is full of the scrolls. There's mysteries and prophecies and things that are going to happen. And if you do something, the angel of peace will probably bless you or something, whatever, whoever the angel of peace is. Angel is messenger. So we could be talking an actual angel, a Christophany, a priest of someone of the Lord, something like that. Um, until the guilty repent. So that gives us a connotation that there's judgments, and judgments are try to, trying to get people to repent. All of the festivals in their periods, uh, because from old you have engraved them on your marvelous something or other. And this is a continual theme from all of these, that the festivals were taught originally. I've got friends that are uh, pan-Babylonian, for instance, and they tell me that you know, Christmas trees are evil, pagan, uh, the Yule Tide is pagan, that kind of stuff. Well, we have documents going back that Adam uh, actually was the creator of what's called Saturnalia. The, the, the Romans made it pagan. Pagans always take real things and make them pagan. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, there's actually a text that talks about that. Now, it's a Pharisee text, not a Dead Sea Scroll. So to be fair, it might be kind of strange, but it's an interesting concept that as we, because we always observe the four festivals, the, the Tekufas, and so to take uh, an extra week off and celebrate the Lord around the winter solstice, that would be a good time to do it because you can't really plant anything or hunt much or that's time to hunker down and, you know, if, if we had snow and ice anyway. So anyway, so this is going on, something about festivals and periods. His judgment, until the ordained time of judgment is recorded in the eternal commands. My son, Canaan, was the fourth generation. Mahaliel, his son, was fifth generation. Jared, his son, was the sixth generation. Enoch and his, his son was seventh generation. And it probably goes on and mentions the rest of them. So you know we're talking about Enos. This is Enos' testament. Because his son is Canaan. So it's Enos, Canaan. So we've got Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch. Okay, and then we go on down. That's the seventh. And then you've got uh, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. So looking at fragment number two, isn't this cool to think that this actually could be a real record from that far back? Anyway, um, you have divided your name for his inheritance. I'm not sure who we're talking about here, but you have divided your name for his inheritance. Dividing the name. Uh, so that he may establish your name there. Could be talking about someone creating the holy city. She, the holy city probably, is the glory of your earthly kingdom. You will eternally watch over her, and your glory will manifest there. I'm thinking Jerusalem. Uh, she will be an eternal passion throughout all the generations to his seed. Now, I, I'm thinking people that are believers in Messiah. All of you guys that love the Lord, that love the Messiah, we, we love Jerusalem. Not because it's anything special, it's just the place the Lord kept. We love the Lord. If you would have picked somewhere else, would be wanting to go over there, you know, that we just love the Lord. So that's definitely going to happen. Your righteous judgment, by your righteous judgment, you will purify him to be an eternal light. You have made him a firstborn son to you. It's going to be talking about Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. They're the ones that started the nation of Israel through whom the Messiah would come. Could be talking about a lot of things. He will be a prince and a ruler of your earthly kingdom. Could be talking about David too. Um, and incidentally, when we go back and look at the Testament or the, the book of Enoch, there's a text in there that talks about the Messiah. It, it doesn't give a date in years of when Messiah would come, but it mentions that he would be the 70th generation 
from Enoch's son. Enoch's son is Methuselah. And if you go to Luke and look at the genealogies, it starts with Jesus and goes all the way back to Adam. But if you count them all the way back, and you get back to uh, Methuselah and then Enoch, it's exactly 70 generations. So there, there are these other... Now, of course, Enoch wouldn't have been born yet, probably, whenever this was written. But still, it's an interesting thing to see. These, more of these prophecies being given out by the Holy Spirit to the prophets. Uh, you, will, you have placed the crown of the heavens and the glory of the clouds upon him. You have placed an angel of your peace in his congregation and given him laws of righteousness as a father does a son. He loves you and he has your spirit. That sounds like Messiah. Through them, you establish your glory. Now, that's really interesting. Not on a limb here, because this doesn't really say this, but if we're talking about God, we're blessing God, and we're talking about his Messiah, and on the Messiah, the Messiah is the Messiah, but there's also his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Lord's spirit, through them, you establish glory. So if the Father